The circuit breaker content that is not suitable for kids like me. Welcome to Crime Crazy, the weekly true crime podcast with Aaron Plyne and Diana Seacon, where we prove that we know nothing about our legal system. Uh, but we're still crazy for a good true crime story. So the reason for that noise is that Aaron learned some things about our legal system. I did. I'm sorry. <sighs> <laughs> One rule. I know. So I talked to some of you guys online about um, the... I keep wanting to call it the birdcage, which is totally the wrong thing. Whole different movie. <laughs> it is, but it, <laughs> it's the owl and the it the staircase. Uh, so on Netflix, and I just finished it, like totally binged it over three days or something, and it's like ninety hours. I don't know. <laughs> um, and I learned all kinds of things, but it was fascinating. And somebody had said in the Facebook group, like it was so one sided. It was so one sided. And I don't think it followed the right side necessarily. Except the other side was super hateful. So I, I don't know. But <laughs> but it was still behind the scenes court stuff and like how defense really works. And like, do you know, how do you pay for it? And how does how does this happen? And how long does it take? And it was so fascinating. All right, I'm gonna have to actually watch it. It was it was cool. It was probably as close to being involved in all of that as I'll ever get. Was yeah. like behind Hope the so. scenes stuff. Well, no, I don't. I don't want to be a defendant. <laughs> but like at this point, I've given up on even jury duty. It's just never gonna happen. I don't know. I mean, I shouldn't say this out loud in a public forum, but I have never been called. I haven't either. I want to. Yeah. So my mother, who. Uh, became an American citizen while I was in college has been called a couple of times, yeah. but I haven't been. My sister served on a grand jury, and I I don't know any details. Like she wasn't allowed to talk about it at the time. I'm not sure that we ever talked about it, but um, she said it was really fascinating. Mm -hmm. Like just, and that's not you know that's just deciding what we're gonna take to court, and you know if it's not the full process, but even right. that would be amazing. Oh yeah. So, uh, lizard update since she's our mascot. Yes. So she is going through a growth spurt, Ooh. like whoa, which didn't I call that like last week? Yeah, when she, <laughs> yeah. So she shed. So she said so she must have been getting bigger, but she also is. She is the best hunter. She. I almost. I almost texted the woman I bought her from last <laughs> night at like eleven o'clock to say, "Oh my god, she's such a good eater." Oh, but she will eat out of my hands, which is a little gross because she eats live bugs. But whatever, yeah. and um, she's perfectly happy to be held, like, just not by anybody, but like she's she knows me enough mm -hmm. that that's so. Um, and she's kind of snuggly, Aww. but she also I take her cave out when I feed her, and then I. I feed her by hand until she's not like so starving that she <laughs> wants to still eat. And then I'll just drop roaches in and she follows my hand. She watches my hand for where I'm going to drop the food. And then she oh. pounces. Oh, God, it's so cute. Oh. She's adorable. We should feed her before you leave. You should take a video. Yeah. So we can check yeah, it. I need to. She's super, super cute. So anyway, that that's the mascot update. Mira's doing great. Yay! She's no longer in the podcasting room because the podcasting room has moved. It has. So, Diana, did you do any learning this week? I did. What did you learn? I learned a lot about cyanide. Ooh! <laughs> oh my god, I learned a little bit about cyanide too. Awesome! <laughs> so anyway, Case File. I was listening to Case File. Eric, I listened to Case File. <laughs> I think it was Chris. Chris, I, I don't remember. <laughs> it was one of the no, two. I of bet them. it was Eric because we were talking about it Monday night when he was over. All right, maybe. Mm -hmm. Anyway, lovely gentleman I work with. I do listen to Case File, or at least I've started. So the Case File I listened to this week was covering the deaths of Susan Snow and Bruce Nickel. Okay. And I don't want to give anything away because you should totally go listen to this. Um, not only the episode, but like the series mm -hmm. uh, from what I've heard is pretty great. But the gist of it is um, back in 1982, there were some murders that were committed via cyanide in Tylenol capsules. Yes. Okay. Yes. So 
I remember that as mm-hmm. a kid. That is where like safety packaging came from. That is Which why is total bullshit. I can no longer open a fucking Tylenol. Yep. <laughs> but apparently, what I what I didn't know is there was a second round hmm. of cyanide in painkiller, except it was Excedrin, and it was to get rid of her husband. Oh. But she did it in a like. She was eventually stupid as hell about it, but um, I don't want to give anything away because it was so good. But anyway, she did it. It was cyanide. It was Excedrin. Was it product tampering or was it because the Tylenol one didn't, it's not solved. Tylenol is unsolved. But still. I think they were pretty sure that it occurred at the packaging plant rather than in a store. No, this, she... Um, I assume bought several bottles, um, tampered with the individual capsules, right? Put them back out on shelves, right? To and cover up what she was see doing. What would happen? So I learned two things from this. Okay. Number one, murder mm-hmm. is an accidental death. Yes. So if you have an accidental death and dismemberment policy, I see where this is. <laughs> Murder is considered an accidental death. You got to say murder and accidental death policy in the same sentence. Is this the best day of your whole life? It pretty pretty much is. (laughs) (laughs) So the other thing I learned is that I have always heard that cyanide smells like bitter almond. Mm -hmm. But it turns out not everybody can smell cyanide. Okay, so that was actually the exact thing that he was like. She listens to Case File because they were talking about that's exactly yeah. what it was. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, only, or not only, 10% of people can't detect the odor of cyanide at all. Only only 10% though. No, 10% cannot. Right. But I mean, like, that just seems like a funny genetic split. I mean, I assume it's genetic. I would guess. I would guess it's recessive. Right. Yeah. I also wonder... Like, what is the taste test group there? Right. But I was making something with almond extract the other day. And mm-hmm. I was like, well, I smell this. Does that mean? <laughs> oh, that's true. But it is smells it, like, I don't know if it's the same. Chem- like, I don't know enough about. it's the same chemical. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, no, that's a good point because. But I was. So, Do you also not smell almonds? I mean, I don't smell a lot of things. Um. But I was, so I was making a cherry clofu tea. Oh. Yes. Aren't you fancy? <laughs> it is less fancy than you think, but I definitely did screw it up. Um, <laughs> I used to be a good cook. But when I was looking it up, it's it's cherry. And it talks about like the longest part of it is taking the pits out of the cherry. Screw that. I used frozen. Um, <laughs> well, cherries aren't in season. I couldn't find any. So I used frozen. True, I really true. wanted this dessert. But the recipe I was reading said that um, the longest part is pitting the cherries, but that French, it's a French dessert. Mm -hmm. Often when it's made in France, they leave the pits in the cherries because the chemical that leaches out of the pit is much like almond extract. So I put almond extract in, often the pits are left in, you eat around them. I gotcha. But is it not arsenic? Well, that was my thought, too, is I thought you, I mean, you don't eat the pits. It just leaches out. But I still feel like that's, I don't feel good about that. Right. (laughs) I mean, although you can eat some cherry pits without worrying. I prefer not to, really. Well, no, but I know that you can. Yeah. I'm Sophie did it recently. Oh, great. <laughs> she didn't die. <laughs> and she's little. And she's little. It would take a lot of cherry pits to kill me off. <laughs> well, I think it would take a lot of cherry pits to kill anybody. Yeah. But yeah, so that is what I learned this week. Fascinating. Go listen to Case File. It's pretty great. So the other thing I wonder about all of that, because there's the cilantro thing like we were talking about yep. tonight. And I have the cilantro thing. Yep. It, it, you know how Comet Cleaner smells. Do. That is how it tastes to me. Yeah. Like if I were to lick Comet, I would expect it to taste exactly like cilantro. <laughs> Don't lick Comet. I'm not going to lick cilantro <laughs> either. Fair. But there's another chemical that is not related, but the same group of people who taste like it reacts the same with whatever that genetic trait is, however it works. Mm. And um, it's one that they used to do in science class when they were explaining genetics in like seventh grade. And you can 
buy it if you're a scientist or a teacher on these little strips of paper yep. in like a pad. I remember that. And then you can taste it. So one of the teachers had some and it was after school and I'm this was like when I was teaching, not when I was a kid. <laughs> And she's like, so you have this cilantro thing. I wonder if you can taste this too. She said, because, you know, it's a, it's like the same percentages of people can't taste it, blah, blah, blah. And we did research and it is tied. She said, I just have to warn you, it doesn't taste good. Like it tastes, it tastes bad. Huh. Um, she said, but this is really old. So it's probably like mostly not. Okay. By bad, she meant like if you drink a gallon of paint, oh. that's what it tastes like and you can't get it out of your mouth. Oh, So no. still a little bitter about that. And yes, I can taste it. Oh, man. <laughs> it was insane. No good. <laughs> but I, that, I wonder if. I wonder if arsenic is at all tied to that or if it's a totally separate... Cyanide. Cyanide. I don't know about arsenic. Uh, cyanide is exactly what I meant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I could. I knew you were picturing it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I was even picturing the word. <laughs> yeah. Yep. That's cool. Yeah. I learned there is a little bit of cyanide in an avocado pit, but not very much. Yes. Like, especially compared to, like, apple seeds or whatever else. Right. It's It's not anything to worry about right you still should not give it to a dog but that's because they will choke or swallow it and get impacted and all sorts of bad things yeah they're delicate they are kind of delicate mm -hmm. also an avocado pit like that is a major it, it's a perfect choking hazard it's slippery it's round it's a it's great shape <laughs> yeah. yeah one didn't you say last week they splinter like dogs will chew them and they splinter they do. and cause problems they do yeah they're they're pretty dangerous. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the things that I learned is that you can feed dogs avocado. There is, in fact, avocado-based dog food. Oh, funny. That the two reasons people give for no avocados for dogs are the pits, which is actually the problem. Yeah. And then this, this stuff in it, this chemical that's in the avocado okay. that does cause issues and build up and everything else in like horses and large birds. So don't feed it to your emu but uh, oh man i know i gotta rethink my emu's whole diet but dogs and cats don't care no you're right. so. good to know yeah aaron uh -huh. did you learn anything i learned so much <laughs> <laughs> what did you learn we're gonna pretend i didn't already say the avocado thing so that i can say my other thing uh, i did have some killer guac today I was jealous of that. I was looking at it going, I can't eat that. I know it would be gross. I can't eat it. But it looks so good. It was really good. It was pretty. This is going to give away my story. Okay. I have vocabulary words. <gasps> Three new vocabulary words for you today. They may or may not be new. And you will sense a theme. Endo-cannibalism. Exo-cannibalism. And necro-cannibalism. So endo internal mm -hmm. exo is external mm -hmm. and necro is dead yes so wait how do you internally cannibal endo cannibalism is cannibalizing someone in your group like your tribe or your culture oh. so it is usually ritual cannibalism so you die i believe that i can keep part of your spirit alive by ingesting part of you oh. so i eat part of you this is like the tribe that gets the horrible Kreutzfeld Jakob. Yeah. 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 Um, exo cannibalism is cannibalizing someone outside of your group. So that would be more like we were in a war. I'm going to kill you and eat your heart to prove that I, you know, am a victor. Okay. So Dahmer was an, well, so that actually is sort of a fourth fourth category because both of those are more ritual and less taboo. They are cultural norms. They are things that people do that's acceptable with their society. Okay. Um, necro cannibalism is the survival kind. We're all in a plane crash. Uh -oh, There's alive. no food. You're dead. I ate you. Um, which is also generally not so taboo. Right. I and mean, if. If it happens, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I go back and forth. Like, I don't think I would kill off the person who was dying in order to eat them. But if they were dead and somebody else prepared that, like, cut cut it off. Like, okay, if I'm going to die, prob I probably would eat somebody. Is that going to be like, I got sick off mayonnaise when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. 
and I can't eat it. And I know there are things I eat that have it in there. Right. But I can't prepare it. Right. But if I make it. I probably will be fine with it. Right. You can't tell me it's in there. Yeah. Yeah. There are things like that with me too. Mm. Uh, Or like I can't think real hard about fish and shrimp because the idea of eating those things really grosses me out. But I kind of like, I don't love them, but I kind of like them and I I sometimes want to eat them. Mm -hmm. So if I don't think about it, it's okay. Anyway, so then there's a fourth, which I didn't find a term for, but that is more of the serial killer or or one time killer mm-hmm. or um, guy who finds a volunteer online or whatever else where you <laughs> eat part of a person. Um, and that's so that's a and we'll talk about that with my story in a little bit. All right. So so since that leads right into my story, I'm going to jump in and go. All right. OK, so I'm going to talk about cannibalism. What? I know. It's a surprise. Shocked. Before I get into my story, which I promise is going to be dreadful. I'm so excited. She's so excited. Uh, I have some cannibalism facts and and things. You almost said fun facts. I... I'm excited it's October because I feel like October gives me permission to go for the, like, intensely gory stuff that I sometimes hold back on and so I'm so excited (laughs) wait should we introduce the theme for October oh my god we should introduce the theme for October (laughs) (laughs) so we have noticed a trend with other horror and true crime podcasts that they tend to really go off the deep end for the month of Halloween. Which I'm totally also going to do. Oh, FYI. 100%. Also, also all in on that one. But, you know, part of the reason that we, we do this is we want to make crime seem... Ridiculous is the wrong word. <laughs> yeah, no, but... Right. We want to point out that crime is absurd. It is not normal. It is not necessarily something that we have to be worried about. We are in a in a time in this country and, and in modern society that crime is very low. Yeah. That a lot of the things we talk about are incredibly rare. Right. And so we're going to tell you some pretty fucked up stories in in October. And then we're going to tell you how it's probably not ever going to happen to you. Right. So for October, instead of being crime crazy, we thought we'd go crime cozy. So now let me tell you a story about cannibalism. Excellent. (laughs) So my thing I learned, the the vocabulary is important. Um, There is one other reason that people argue you might eat someone, aside from endocannibalism, exocannibalism, and necrocannibalism. You might also be insane. Valid. So here's the thing. That is a hot, hotly debated topic. It is, there are passionate people on both sides of the argument. Um, there are countries, as we will learn, where if you eat someone, that, de- that you are insane. That act proves that you have something going on that is not normal. Um, there are other countries where that's not the case and they say, well, you, you, maybe you're just a bad person mm-hmm. or maybe you're a scientist who wanted to do a test or maybe you're an artist and this is part of your, your point that you're trying to prove. Right. So, you know that cannibalism isn't illegal in the United States, except in like Idaho. Really? Yep. Uh, killing the person, not Okay. Right. Buying body parts, not okay. Buying body parts, not okay. Um, but just eating the person, mm-hmm. fine. It's fine. Well, that that makes sense because as I was researching instances of cannibalism to try to determine like how prevalent is it, mm-hmm. um, which I'll get to at the end after I scare everyone to death. Um, <laughs> there, I was surprised at the percentage of recorded incidences of cannibalism that were not I killed someone and ate them Mm -hmm. but they were other things like I work for a newspaper and I wrote an article on how people taste or and so I you know purchased this or I obtained this or um, there was a I think he was British rock 
star and he was in a motorcycle accident and his finger was severed and mm-hmm. couldn't be reattached. So he ate it on stage. Like when there was the guy that just ate his foot. Yeah. And which is hopefully not what you're going to talk about. <laughs> no, no. Cause yeah, he lost it to an accident, I think. And was right. like, what the hell? Let's cook it. Right. <laughs> I have this piece of flesh and this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. Hopefully. Um, yeah, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go get in another motorcycle accident because that was good. Yeah, no. No bueno. Um, so the the first person I'm going to talk about is not who my crime is about, but I thought that we should have a little bit of context for cannibalism. And so I have a quote um, written around 1930 by a New York Times reporter, William Seabrook, who obtained a chunk of human meat from a healthy but recently deceased adult. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, he didn't obtain it from him so much as apparently an intern at the morgue um, and ate it. And then so that we would all know, described what it tastes like. So I'm going to read it in his words, which great writer he is not. <laughs> Noted. It was like good, fully developed veal. Not young, but not yet beef. It was very definitely like that, and it was not like any other meat I had ever tasted. It was so nearly like good, fully developed veal that I think that no person with a palate of ordinary, normal sensitiveness could distinguish it from veal. It was mild, good meat with no other sharply defined or highly characteristic taste, such as, for instance, goat, high game, and pork have. The steak was so slight, was slightly tougher than prime veal, a little stringy, but not too tough or stringy as to be agreeable, agreeably edible. The roast from which I cut and ate a central slice was tender and in color, texture, smell, as well as taste strengthened my certainty that of all the meats we habitually know, veal is the one meat to which this meat is accurately comparable. Hmm. Because I'd always heard pork. I have always heard pork Long as well. pork. Yes. And the longest. Yeah. <laughs> well, always pork and always like strong pork. Right. Not gamey, but strong. Right. Yeah. Yep. Interesting. So, Not a great writer. Not a great writer. Other things that I learned about cannibalism are that it occurs in every species. So not just humans. Um, And that if you are an aquatic species, you are more likely to cannibalize the other members of your species than if you are not. So it happens Hmm. in the ocean a lot. Um, Even octopuses do it, much to my disappointment. All right. So on to my story. You ready? Yes. All right. So I'm going to butcher a name. Was that a deliberate pun? Nope, I'm that good. (laughs) (laughs) Cheryl's going to be so proud. I know. (laughs) I don't have any clue how to pronounce anything in Japanese. And this person is Japanese. Oh, my. And the first name might be Issei. And the last name might be Sagawa. I'm going to take your word for it. So that's what I'm going to call him. Sure. He was born on June 11th, 1949. So that was before you, right? It was even before me. (laughs) It was before my parents. Um, Yeah, even before my parents. Yeah, it was a long time ago. So he was born to very wealthy parents. Um, He was born very premature and small, and he had some health issues when he was younger um, that they were able to take care of. So it is said that he fit in the palm of his father's hand when he was born, which is totally possible. But the way that I read it in different articles, it almost was like an urban legend has it that, Uh, you know, so I didn't know whether that was literal or he was just real little and real early. Was he affected by like fallout? Like, do we know? Oh, I don't know. Uh, The article definitely said, and I looked at it and went, well, I can't say that. So I didn't write it down. (laughs) Fair. So, Japanese is a mystery to me. <laughs> right? I already knew I was going to butcher the name. So as a child, he was sick. Um, and he was definitely spoiled. Uh, later in his adult life, like his dad stepped in to take care of his problems and, and all of that kind of stuff. So I think that probably always contributes when you don't have any responsibility of your own. Mm. Um, but it was first grade. So what, six, seven years old yeah. when he first felt the desire to eat somebody. 
That's real little. Yeah. Which I'm trying to think like, I feel like around that age, the thought of animals or meat, I eat animals. People are animals. Are people meat? Seems like appropriate developmentally. It does, but that is when you say something like that to your mom and she goes, we don't eat people. Right. But if no one said, we don't eat people, and you allowed that fantasy to continue to grow, yeah, maybe, yeah. maybe that's not so abnormal. Well, especially if it wasn't stigmatized. Like, I, you know, I bet lots of five and six year olds think about that. And then like, there's the, we don't eat people. Right. And there's such a stigma there that it's not addressed further. Right. Yeah. Because that's a pretty strong, like there are lots of things I see we don't do that I'm less emphatic about than eating people. Yeah. I don't know. I I have a friend that um, I used to work with that we've had like cannibalism discussions and she's a biologist and her view on the whole thing is it's meat. Like don't kill someone and eat them. But if there's right. human meat, like why, why not? It's just meat. Well, I know there are places like specifically in Asia that will serve human meat. Mm-hmm. And if I ended up in one of those places, maybe, maybe. So, um, I mean, I had a snail for Christ's sake. I am not. I My don't. sister ate a bunch one year. I don't recommend it. No, I have no intention of it. I, I did eat a yellow jacket, but it was by accident. Oh, yeah. I mean, we've all done that. But <laughs> <laughs> so usually the reaction I get is, how the fuck did you accidentally eat a yellow jacket? So I like your reaction better. Uh, bugs fly places. Yeah. <laughs> there have been bugs in all sorts of places I'm not okay with. <laughs> and now I have that image in my head. Not that, but... <laughs> Bugs. You go up to, you yeah. go up to the woods. Up your bugs. Nose. Yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely. All in your hair. So I don't know much about Japanese culture. It is not my understanding that eating people is cool with everybody there. But I feel like in his family, it probably was never addressed. Sure. Um, right and wrong or supervision or both were not big priorities for this group. Because the other thing he did before he was an adult, is have sex with his dog. Mm. That's another thing I'm pretty emphatic about. Yes. We don't fuck the pets. No. No. Very few things you're allowed to fuck. Only things that say yes. Enthusiastically. Or or certain appropriate, cleanable, inanimate objects would probably be just fine. Well, that's fine. But, you know. Yeah. If there's living and breathing, you got to get a yes out of them. Right. And, no, wait, that was bad phrasing. That was terrible <laughs> phrasing. No, don't do that. <laughs> An enthusiastic yes should be received before proceeding. Right. <laughs> also, when I said do- when I said this statement about the dog, um, my dog went <laughs> and sat straight up like, ah, oh, no. No, uh-uh. So. Not dog approved. So he was already having a rough time before he made it to adulthood. The other thing he had going on is some real self-loathing, which, I mean, I see how he got there. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But what he hated about himself is that he was very small, um, only 4'9", so pretty short. He started Um, out pretty... He started out very small, yeah. Um, And he described himself as kind of feminine, not somebody that people would find attractive. Um, He wasn't very strong. His voice was not very low. It was a little higher. Um, And so he became really obsessed early on with this idea of the perfect woman. And not that he wanted to be the perfect woman, but like he felt like he was the exact opposite of who he should be as a man. And so this idea of a perfect woman was both something he was obsessed with, like he wanted to attain like and own that, but he also really hated women who fit that vision because they were perfect, whereas he was not the perfect counterpart. Is this like early incel? Yeah, a little bit, actually. Yeah, that's Uh, that's kind of the beginnings. So actually hold that thought until we get to the, that part, because yes, that was actually I didn't think about it right here, but later on, yes. Yeah. So his idea of the perfect woman was, you know, of course, like 
tall and slim and whatever else, but also Western. He was mm-hmm. not attracted to Asian women at all. And so all the women he went after were European. Which he, is funny because so many men of non-Asian descent think women of Asian descent are yeah. <laughs> the ideal. That's yeah. Kind of funny. <laughs> yeah. So he found one. And this was before college. So as an older teenager um, that he just thought was perfect. She was German. Uh, she was living in Japan where he was at the time. And he wondered if he could eat her. Well, that escalated quickly. Yeah. So one night he followed her home and he snuck into her apartment and was thrilled to find her asleep and almost naked, like not, you know, probably wearing a nightgown, like not right. a whole lot of clothes. Yeah. And so he was like, man, this is a great opportunity. Uh, I'm going to bludgeon her to death and eat her. But he didn't come prepared for this activity. So he's looking around her house for something to bludgeon her to death with. And she woke up. So she screams. He runs away. She calls the police. Eventually, they catch up with him, according, depending on which article you read. Um, and they charge him with attempted rape. Mm -hmm. Because no one knew that his actual intention was to murder her and eat her. Well, I mean, if I could get away with just being charged with rape instead of attempted murder and cannibalism. Yes. I'd go with that. Yeah. Well, and attempted. Attempted rape. Attempted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Didn't touch her at all. No. So at age 27, he decided he was going to go to college in Paris. (sighs) So he moved to Paris. Paris. When he got there, it was scary. So he purchased a twenty two caliber rifle for self-protection. Didn't know you could do that in France. Apparently. Apparently you can. Also, I feel like that's not the best self-defense weapon. A I rifle? know literally nothing about guns. I mean, it's a, it's big, right? If it's a rifle, it's like a it's long. shotgun. Yeah, yeah. Why would, that wouldn't be a good self-defense. I mean, if thing. somebody showed me a rifle, I'd get the hell out. True. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> so that was why he bought it on paper. Um, in fact, it was so that he could someday murder someone and eat them. Oh, not in Paris. Yes. He said that for most of that first year, he would hire prostitutes every night and bring them home. And then he would try to shoot them, but he could never pull the trigger. And I'm going to call a little bit of bullshit on this because someone would have said something. Who has every night sex worker money? Oh, I I believe that part. I just don't believe that every night he pointed a gun at somebody and no one ever said anything. Well, was it that he pointed the gun or that he tried to work himself up to it and could never like even put the gun in his hands? So he wrote a couple of autobiographical but sort of fictionalized novels later. And in one of them, he says he it was in his hand. He couldn't pull the trigger. He couldn't make his body do that. Mm -hmm. So according to him, he had it in his hand. I don't know. My guess is that in reality, there were several instances like this. Maybe he pointed a gun at several people. He never got up the nerve to kill people. Probably more often there was some other point of panic in there. Well, and so let's think about timing too. If he was born in 48, Mm -hmm. he's 29. This is the late Mm seventies. Mm-hmm. Okay, still late 70s, yeah. hiring sex workers. Mm-hmm. I mean, even if he did point a gun at a whole bunch of them. Well, right, most of them are not going to go to the police and say, so, I was breaking the law when. Right. But I feel like if you do it every night for a year, somebody. Somebody's going to say. Or word would get around, yes. like the sex worker community, don't, yes. don't go with this guy. Right. And also, I should point out that prostitutes was like the word that oh, was yeah, yeah. appropriate for the time and not, not right. trying to be like disrespectful and all of that good stuff. But then he met another woman who was the perfect woman mm-hmm. and her name was Renee Hart- Hartvelt and he fell in love with her. So it's German again. It is. He, she is. He's got a type. He does. <laughs> uh, fell in love with her and hated her. Of and course. the thing he was the most obsessed with were her arms, which were very white. And he really fantasized about the skin on her arms a lot. They kind of dated. 
they went out a bunch of times. Um, she was always willing to hang out with him. He was, of course, like just obsessed with her, but he was also smart enough. He'd had a pretty good education. He was able to talk to people, kind of that sociopath charming kind of thing going sure. on. And and so she was interested in going out and hanging out with him. Um, and then one day he invited her over to his apartment for dinner. And I guess in his mind, this whole time they had been dating, and in her mind, that was not quite what it was. So he asked her to read a poem by his favorite German author, and she did. And then she went home later that night, and he smelled and licked the place that she'd sat. And then he promised himself that he would eventually kill and eat her, that she was going to be the one. Ew. Right? Already not okay. Yeah. And it gets worse. So shortly after that, he asked her to come over again. And this time he w wanted her to record or he wanted to record her reading his favorite poem. Um, he was studying language at the time and there was a lot of like, can you help me translate this? And that was a lot of their interaction and relationship was based around this language. Sure. And uh, so she agreed because, I mean, she doesn't know him and they've been good friends. And so he came over or she came over. He had his cassette recorder out. He had her sit on the floor and he gave her tea, but he had poured whiskey in the tea. And so he was trying to get her drunk and lower her inhibitions. And when he thought enough time had passed and surely it worked, he told her that he wanted to take her to bed. And she said, basically, oh, I really like you, but I don't like you like that. Yeah. And so hate to wor use the word friend zone, but I'm fairly certain that's what was going through his mind yeah. because then he gave her he was like oh okay cool whatever will you still record this poem for me gave her the book turned on the cassette recorder walked behind her as she is recording and engrossed in this piece of poetry grabbed his his rifle and shot her in the back of the neck <sighs> at which point he passed out there he came to and he decided like he'd gone this far he was going to finish his fantasy and that's when the cannibalism started. Yes. <laughs> Actually, no. Oh, First, man. he raped her corpse. Then the cannibalism started. Oy. Yeah. There, this was all very much as cannibalism tends to be in this kind of situation. It's all about sex. Yep. And so there was a lot of like, like masturbation and sexual thoughts. And it was all for him very, very much tied up in that. So... The first thing he did after he had killed her and had sex with her was he cut off, um, it says the tip of her left breast was what it said in the article, so I'm assuming nipple, and <laughs> a piece of her nose, those were the places he started, he ate those. That's not, I mean, nipple, okay. Right, at least that fits that like sexual and cannibalism thing he well, had going on. And also, like, meaty. The tip of your nose is cartilage. So he does that a couple more times, too, with other pieces of cartilage. I think he likes the texture and the, like, crackling. Oh. Yeah. I don't feel like I would find that pleasing at all. No. Especially not in my mouth. Well, but I'm thinking, like, you know, every once in a while you get a bad part of a chicken wing. Yeah. Like, that's not cool. No. Yeah, I agree. Uh -uh. Ate those. Uh, I guess that was his appetizer and then he decided that he wanted to bite her because he had cut those off and eaten them and they were small pieces um now he just wanted to like tear into her with his teeth and so he gave it a lot of thought and eventually decided butt cheek was the right place yeah. so he bit her on the butt um but it was a lot tougher than he thought he wasn't able to get a good bite so at that point, he just got out his knife and he was like, I'm just going to butcher her. Mm. So he starts cutting her up. He paid so much attention to everything he was doing that later when he wrote his books, he described in detail. And it's this very visceral kind of description of like how the fat came out of her body when he cut and then how the blood came out and how what it looked like and what it smelled like and what it felt like and what it tasted like and very very detailed and into this a lot it never occurred to him the entire time he was eating her that it was cannibalism uh -huh. which might not be okay he just he was totally enthralled and in the moment wow 
So after cutting her up for a while and tasting different parts of her, eating some of it raw or all of it at this point was raw, uh, he went and got his electric carving knife and continued to cut her up. Some of what he ate, he ate raw. Some of it he put in the fridge for later. At some point, he decided that it wasn't terribly full of flavor, whatever part of her he was eating. And so he fried it up with some, fried fried her up with some mustard and ate that. Um, I guess he was real hungry because he seems to eat a lot in this one period of time. I don't know that mustard would have been. I never really think of fried with, I guess I do eat mustard on fried things. But I think he was just trying to go for some spice. Right. But how about some garlic or... Right. Garlic and red wine is what Mivis did. Yeah. Yeah. No, he went with mustard. All right. Um, I mean, I'm sure it was a nice full grain. I mean, it wasn't French's, hopefully. No, probably not. Maybe even not in like France. <laughs> mustard seed. Yeah. No. Yeah. No. But it, it was good mustard. <laughs> I, I would hope that if you're gonna cannibalize someone, that like you spring for the, the good <laughs> garnishes and sauces, <laughs> the top shelf. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a terrible person. So uh, at this point, he starts listening to the tape of her reading, and which also must have contained the gunshot because he was recording her when he shot her, hmm. um, which was just super, super exciting, and decided now it was time to cut off the rest of her breast. So he did, and he baked it. But it was real oily because mm. it's a lot of fatty tissue, and he really preferred to eat her thighs. It was late. He was tired. He was very full. So he decided it was bedtime and he knew he was going to have to deal with the cleanup and the and getting away with it and all of that. But right now it's sleepy time. So he took her corpse to bed and slept with her. And when he woke up the next morning, he was expecting to have to dispose of the rest of the body that wasn't in the fridge. But she didn't stink. So he was like, hmm, and decided to eat her some more. And so he chewed on her arm, the one that he had been so obsessed with. And said that it was more delicious than he ever could have imagined. That is just like a recipe for food poisoning. You can't leave meat (laughs) out overnight. (laughs) You're a worse person than I am. That's just, that is, come on. You can't leave shit out of the fridge overnight and expect to eat it and be okay. I don't care if it is a person or a pizza or a leftover steak. You got to take care of your food safety. It's true. <laughs> Although, really, if he got food poisoning, he would totally deserve it. Well, yeah, but I mean, take some basic goddamn precaution. It's true. It's true. I don't know how. I am a terrible person. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I was about to say, like, if it is freshly killed, do you have a little more wiggle room than stuff you buy from the store? I mean, what time of year was this? I have no clue. Because I think that would matter. What was the heat situation like in there? I mean, a lot of places in Paris don't have air conditioning because they don't really need it. Right. So, but if it was, but it can get real hot in the summer. Like the last time I was there in the summer, it was real nasty. hot. So the other thing about it is, though, that it sounds like he snuggled her all night long. So even if the room was refrigerator cold, she wasn't. Whatever was left of her. I don't know how much he cut up. I don't know how open she she was. She would have to be by then. Like, that's when you start, like, rigor mortis would have started setting Oh, yeah, yeah. No, but I mean, like, his body heat didn't keep her refrigerator cold. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't think you could even necessarily count on... The surroundings. Right, so even if it were chilly. Yep. Oh. So after eating this arm, which was the most delicious thing he ever could have imagined, he was like, but what if I go the other direction and think about some of the parts of the body that like you don't want to eat because they're kind of gross? Like all of them. Well, yes. So I have a question. If you were going to eat a person, what are three body parts you would not eat? Well, liver, because mm. liver is gross, and my grandma was a bad cook, and she made liver, and do the math. <laughs> um, so liver is always off the table. Um, are we talking only internal parts? Nope. You got the whole body. Feet. Feet? No feet. Mm-hmm. No. I don't even like a live feet. 
<laughs> and um, I mean, I think I would have trouble with any of the internal organs. Mm-hmm. Brain seems like it would be bad eating. Also, that's where you're going to get like craziness. Well, only if the person whose brain you were eating had a. Prion- yes. I read a whole book about prion disorders. They're very interesting and very horrible. Yeah. But, but would it, you want to risk it? You don't know. Well, right? I wouldn't, but I also like, if you think about brain tissue, it's neither fat nor muscle. It just seems like it would be an unpleasant textury mess. Yeah. Fun side story. Also hard to get out. Also hard to get out. So fun side story is that um, my mom and I got in a fight when I was like 16 and I, I mean, I was wrong. I was 16. Um, <laughs> oh, I didn't think so at the time, but she also overreacted. Mm-hmm. I think I called her a bitch. Actually, I think is what happened. And um, so in a real twisted apology, when she went grocery shopping, she bought me a present. But the present was a can of pig brain in milk, which you can buy at the grocery store. Wait, what? Yes. It was a can of pig's brain in milk. People eat that? Apparently. So I took it to school. You southerners are weird. Oh, no. (laughs) It wasn't pickled pig's feet, which is a big thing. There are whole festivals where that's like the food they serve. And the whole festival smells like pickled pig's feet, which is amazingly horrible. So I am not a, like feet are off the table, but again, they don't seem like good eating and pig's yeah. feet especially. Yeah. Cause they're hooves. Right. Although they, they cut the hoof part off. Right. But, but what else? Like, uh, I don't know a tiny little bit of feet that have spent their whole lives walking through pig shit pickled in something that i think is poisonous it's awful anyway um i took it to school and i paid two of david's friends a dollar each so i bought them a slice of pizza essentially uh (laughs) to eat it and they did and i did not i also don't like milk so like that didn't help (laughs) no um also pig's brains in milk are light pink it looks like a strawberry milkshake so let's go back to this it was in a can. So it was shelf stable. Oh, Lord. <laughs> so it's in a can. And uh-huh. was it like, was it like chunks of brain and milk? Or uh-huh. was it like a slurry? It was like a s- chunky slurry. So like, it was a, like a milkshake mixer? that's a little, or like a milkshake that's a little too frozen. So it's kind of chunky, but the chunks aren't real solid. It's so like, like a concrete. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That is fucked up. Right? <laughs> Somebody buys that other than my mom. Which again is like a, you know, sometimes you look at food and you're like, who came up with that? Right. Like, that's one of those. Someone was real desperate. Right. Real weird. You look in the fridge and you're like, I got pig's brains. I got milk. Let's do this. Right. 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 <laughs> <laughs> so none of your answers. And a canner. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wonder how I can make this last for a real long time. Right. Winter's coming. Okay. Don't want to give this up. Right. My pink soup. Oh, ew. Yep. So all of your ideas are disgusting. Not where he went. Remember how I said there was going to be an anus in my story? (gasps) No. So he cut out her anus. Um. So. I know. (laughs) No, no, no. (laughs) I was recently thinking about how one would cut out an anus. I'm sorry. (laughs) What? <laughs> Go on. How? Did you want to give any context to that? Or are you just going to leave no, us? No, I hand? mostly don't remember why I was thinking about it, actually. Um, I think it was must have been some other tra- true crime thing I was listening to that was talking about, because this is not the first dismemberment of that fashion I've heard of. Right, right. Um, but... Like, how? Do you, like, cut around, like, when you're cutting the stem off a pumpkin when you're going to carve it? I think you must. I mean, it is essentially attached to all the rest of your insides and guts, right? Like, your intestines well, and right, all of that. It's just the end of your intestine. Right. So, 
I feel almost like if you cut a circle around it, could you grab it and pull it out? I mean, I'm assuming there's like some more connective tissue in there, but... But it's essentially a tube. Yeah. It is. So cut out our anus. And he tried to eat it. He put it in his mouth, um, or a piece of it in his mouth, but oh, it was real smelly. And he spit back out. Yeah. So then he was like, that's a cool, I'll, I'll just fry it. So he fried it. Apparently frying an anus does not make the smell go away. And he still couldn't eat it. So he yeah. had to give up on it. He put it back in her. Where it came from. Did he? He didn't like sew it back in and try to reattach it or anything, did he? I think he just like was like and put it back where it came from. <laughs> I regret that. Oh, yeah. but now it's fried. Now I have this picture of like a little Parisian apartment, dead girl on the floor, and a guy being like, Ew. Yes, <laughs> like, uh, shoving an anus back in. <laughs> right. This poor girl. Oh. I have to not think of her as a human because she was. She was a nice girl. Yeah. And now, not so much. So at this point, flies arrive. Yep. So he chopped her up with a hatchet into pieces that would fit into these two suitcases that he owned. And his plan was that he was going to take her to this pond, throw the suitcases in the pond. It was in a park near his house. And, and that was how he was going to dispose of her and get away with it. Did he not have neighbors? I don't. I mean. There's a gunshot. There's hatcheting. There are flies. Right. And now, I'm guessing there's some smell. Yeah, I mean, if there's flies. Uh, so even with the flies and the fact that he chopped her up to dispose of her because, like, now she's spoiled. Um, first of all, chopping her up really aroused him. He then chewed on her nose and her ears to hear the crunch of the cartilage. He liked that. Mm. Then he cut out her tongue, which apparently was quite a challenge because of rigor mortis. Her jaw was locked up and he couldn't get it out. So he had to like cut under and reach in and like go between her teeth and under her chin and like get it out. So that was challenging, but he got it out and he put it in his mouth and he stood in front of the mirror and he watched himself chew the tongue. Very exciting. Would you fuck me? I'd fuck me. Yeah, I just... This whole thing is so gross. Then he cut out her eyes. Then he, since she was already chopped up and opened up, he explored like her abdominal cavity and all of her organs. Um, And then I thought this was such an interesting fact that never would have occurred to me. But he burned his hands on all of her gastric juices. Oh, sure. Yeah. Never would have occurred to me. Now autopsies like are very different in my head. Well, right, because isn't it the strength, like stomach acid is the same strength as like battery acid. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, I never would have thought of that. I had never even considered that, but anyone who dismembers a body runs that risk. Sure. Not not just if you're eating it. Yeah, no, I never thought about that. So good thing to keep in mind if you're going to kill someone, well, watch but, out. But also, if you don't open the stomach, like the juices aren't in the abdominal cavity, he must have opened up the stomach. He did. He was or... poking around and playing with all of her organs. And Which I mean, he'd already do. They open up the stomach to see what what's, what's going it? on yeah. there. Yeah, got to be careful. I mean, they are gloved. He was not. Right, but you got to be careful of like all, all of that. Would this be splatter or spatter? That would be splatter. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, at this point, it's just ooze. I think. I was thinking more for autopsy. Oh. Like, you want to put the glasses on and the gloves and... Yeah. Yeah. Especially if there's, like, any bloat or pressure or right. anything else. Um, so, cut out her eyes, played with the inside of her. Uh, then he called a cab and got in the cab with his bleeding suitcases and went to the park. Uh, he was going to dump her in the pond, but it was a lot of work. The suitcases were real heavy. and <laughs> There was a girl in them. Yes. Well, parts, parts of a there girl. There was half a girl in each of them. Yep. Well, minus what he ate and what's in the fridge. Right. But he was a little guy. He was a little guy. Although he seems to have done a pretty good job eating. Like, that's a lot of meat. If it's meat, that was a lot. I mean, 
I can take down some heat. <laughs> You're not four nine. No, I am. I am five eight. <laughs> <laughs> You're almost a foot taller than him. I am almost a foot taller, and guarantee I could probably eat him under the table. <laughs> <laughs> Except he ate a person, and I I don't think you'd eat more person than him. No, I prefer cow. Yeah, if it comes down to it. So um, when he was in the park with these suitcases and sort of trying to decide what to do and, and kind of giving up on this idea of dumping her in the pond, uh, he looked up and this couple was looking at him. And I mean, they just glanced at him like, here's a dude with suitcases in a park and it's like the middle of the night and what's going on. Um, but it, it freaked him out. And so he dropped the suitcases just where he was and he fled. And so the couple came over to look at these suitcases which seems unwise, but whatever. Yeah. And they saw that they were bleeding and a woman's hand was hanging out of one of them. So oh, they Christ. called the police. Uh, the police came, opened up the suitcases, saw the dismembered body, most of a dismembered body. Uh, they managed to identify her and to uh, like put piece together where she may have been. And eventually they do get back to him. Meanwhile, he is back at his apartment uh, just eating. He said that she, that every single day that he was free before they managed to catch him, he ate a little bit of her. And then as time went on, she got sweeter and sweeter. So I guess as she kind of spoiled or settled or something. aged, aged, she aged. Yep. So the French police showed up at his door. He put up no resistance, never denied what he did. Uh, they arrested him. There was some brief period of time where I think he escaped and then he went to somebody else's house or whatever. But eventually they had him in custody. They arrested him. They um, took him to court. They, The judge and, and whoever was involved in whatever sort of proceeding needed to happen there said, well, he ate a person. He's not denying it. He's not sorry about it. He's telling us about it in loving detail. He's insane. We can't try him. He can't put up a defense or he can't understand the law or whatever. We need to just take him to a hospital and, and put him there. So they did. Uh, but while he was in this hospital, because he wasn't under arrest, and I'm guessing that their laws about profiting from crimes differ from ours, yeah. he wrote and published a book in the fog, which was his first semi fictionalized or, you know, at least like glorified account of his kill and eating this woman. And it gained a lot of popularity. It was very sensational. Not people who were like, this is amazing, but like, right. oh my God, did you see this? And, and so that played a really big part in the French government's decision to deport him back to Japan. Sure. So they did. When he got to Japan, the Japanese doctors, so one of the things about the French doctors, there were, there were many who diagnosed and tried to treat and everything else. They said 100% he will never be cured. He has to be hospitalized and kept away from people for the rest of his life. There's nothing we can do. Gets to Japan and they were like, you're not insane. You're evil, but you're totally competent. So we're going to have a trial and we're going to arrest you and we're going to charge you and this is going to happen. And then they ran into a problem that's going to make you so mad, which was because he had been declared insane in France. And so he had never been charged in court with these crimes. Mm -hmm. They sealed all of the records and they could not or would not give them to the Japanese police. So the Japanese police had no evidence on which to charge him. Huh. Even though he wrote a book about it and admitted it. Even though there was physical evidence. But there's no jurisdiction. True. I don't, I don't know how it should have happened. But I do know that him being set free with no penalty whatsoever, which is what happened, should not have happened. So this is where I often have questions. Um... I did some research into pedophilia quite a number of years ago for reasons. Um, Which I'm not that Diana is any way attracted to children, by the way. No. Um, but something I learned is that people that are sexually attracted to children 
feel the same way about children that I feel about nerdy, dark haired, skinny boys with glasses. Mm -hmm. It's how they're wired. It's what they're attracted to. By boys, you mean men? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Now that I'm a grown ass woman. (laughs) But yeah, I have a type. They have a type. It is an inappropriate type. Right. There's nothing wrong. Right. They're competent. Right. They're not insane. They're not necessarily even ill. Right. I don't necessarily believe it's a mental disorder. There is no treatment. Right. It's just how they are. Yeah. And with somebody like him, like he was a functional adult. He went to college. He moved to a different country. He, you know, Mm -hmm. I'm assuming did well enough in his studies that they didn't kick him out of school. He doesn't seem to have any other mental health problems other than the fact he killed and ate a woman. Right. So So where, again, and even like with personality disorders, where is the line between it's a disorder and you're just a dick? Right. And where is the line with him with the behavior engaged in was criminal? You're not insane. We probably shouldn't let you around people, but we don't really have any reason to keep you away. Right. I mean, the behavior he exhibited, I mean, he murdered someone, so he he should be away. Right. But the Japanese government has no jurisdiction over that. No. 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 And and they now have no evidence. It didn't right. sound like the issue was so much jurisdiction. It sounded like they would have proceeded, but they yeah. they didn't have any grounds. They didn't have any information. There was nothing. Right. And it had no way to force it out of the French government. No. And the French government wasn't willing to give it to them because they had determined that he was mentally ill and needed to be hospitalized. The Japanese government was not on board with that. Yeah. So there was never going to be any cooperation. I think the French government made a mistake in sending him back to Japan. And I get why there was some pressure, but I think that would have been the only, the only thing that would have been fair and safe for society is to keep him where he was. Yeah. And not let him write any more books. Right. Yeah. Obviously no son of Sam laws going on over there. Right, right. <laughs> well, and so then that's another thing that I don't really know is if you are, instead of being convicted, if you're not even charged, but you are now in some sort of, this was actually an asylum. I forget what it was called. Let's see. Um, the Paul, Paul Gerard Asylum. So does Son of Sam apply here? If you are not imprisoned. So I am not a lawyerologist, but my (laughs) understanding is that son of Sam laws only apply if you are convicted of that crime of that crime. Because like OJ, who was not convicted, wrote the book. Yeah. Um. And ultimately didn't profit from it because the Goldman family sued, as they fucking should have. Yes. But because he had not been convicted, Son of Sam didn't apply. Right. But like Gacy, when he was still alive, couldn't sell his paintings. Right. Um, but he could donate them and now other people sell them. Right. Right. Well, and if you are, I mean, it would be stupid to do, but if you were imprisoned, incarcerated, and convicted of one thing, but not of another. You could profit from that other one. Yeah, I think they might clamp down on that. I mean, I would hope that that would just immediately lead to charges and another conviction. Well, I think earning any kind of money in prison that's not like prison wages is problematic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so he was allowed to go free. Um, he, for the next several years, appeared on talk shows in some porn films that were super questionable to the line between like, okay and not okay. Uh, lots of tabloids, lots of interviews, wrote another book. He is now currently today alive and free 
and able to do whatever he wants. Although I am happy to say he cannot find anyone who will hire him. He has tried to apply for several jobs at several different locations for which he was qualified and even almost got the job and people protested and he's not been able to find any kind of work. He had to, when his parents died, he had to sell all his property to settle their debts. So he didn't have any of their money. Um, and so he's just poor and alone and everyone knows who he is. And so he won't ever. Yeah. Well, and now he's 70. True. True. So, you know, kind of past the age where people are Oh yeah, now he's gonna he, hire him. Now he definitely can't. But it wasn't very many years after his release that like I think everybody got over the shock of it and then it was like, but wait, you're a bad person and we're not gonna support that. Well, can you imagine I mean you think about businesses that like hire a known sex offender mm -hmm. and the risk that they open themselves up to. Mm -hmm. Imagine hiring a known cannibal. <laughs> Right. <laughs> it's like, no, that's yeah. way too much liability. Right. Certainly you could not also have female employees. No, no, what no, no, woman no, no, no. would ever agree to that? No, 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 no. I Jeffrey Dahmer walks in our workplace. I'm, I'm out. Well, yeah. although he wasn't into women, so. <laughs> I'd still be out just in case. Just like in case. with the brains, I'm not going to risk it. Right. So one of the things that he said, which I think he thinks makes up for some of this, um, in in an interview, was that he would like to invite any woman. So I'm going to read the quote. I would like to invite any woman who wants to kill me. To step forward, beautiful women only. That would be the ideal way for me to die. Maybe they can shoot me up with morphine so that I don't feel any pain, although I guess the pain is part of the pleasure. Dying instantly is boring, so I want to savor the process of being killed. An alternative would be to drown in female saliva. Wouldn't it be wonderful to be all covered in women's spit? If I could die drowning in it, that would be my ultimate dream come true. I'm a cowardly man who killed another person, yet I can't face killing myself. So I guess dying at the hands of a woman would be my way to redemption. I have a stunned Diana. <laughs> she is just staring at me with this look of horror. Wow. Indeed. I'm real glad I'm not a puker now. <laughs> <laughs> right? No, that one was pretty That's horrible. pretty rough, yeah. It was, it was very detailed. When I first read about it, I was like, oh, well, this is definitely the one that I'm going to do. But there wasn't very much detail. It was, he always wanted to do this. He tried over and over again. Um, I think the first, the very first thing I read was actually on Wikipedia. And it was not very detailed. But then I found some some articles. He's There are a bunch of interviews. You can watch him talk about all of these things. He is just so narcissistic. And so yeah, I feel like he's almost delusional. One of the things that I that I didn't say before was when he was eating, like biting her ears and her nose and eating the tongue and all of that, he held up her head by her hair at one point and looked at it and he had cut most of the, the flesh from her face. And so it was mostly a skull. And that was the point where he was like, huh, I'm a cannibal. That was the first time it even occurred to him that eating another human being there was a name for that and people don't do it. Wow. Yeah. So I, I do think there were some mental health issues with him, not just because he ate a person, but because of his just blatant disregard for any kind of human life and this like disconnection from his actions. Right. So. Wow. Although I think some of that was how he was raised. Well, yeah. I mean, narcissism is kind of delusional yeah. when it comes right down to it, but... Right. Wow. So, that's my story. So, now let me give you the cozy part. Cannibalism is... I'm all wrapped up in my favorite cozy sweatshirt. <laughs> Lots of pillows. I got some baileys. That's right. It's perfect cozy time. Cannibalism is insanely rare. When it occurs... Like we talked about with the endo and exo and necro and all of that. It's generally for, it's generally accepted in that society. Mm -hmm. That's the most common form of cannibalism. Um, and a lot of, like today, it's it's even more rare, right? Those are, are more in our past. There is a lot of talk about whether or not previous forms of humans before we became humans, mm -hmm. homo sapiens, um, 
were involved in cannibalism Mm -hmm. uh, just naturally like the animal kingdom is um and and i think there's a pretty strong argument for yes that is part of it and so i mean human beings still are involved in cannibalism in a ritualistic sense why wouldn't previous incarnations right have done it for survival sure so even even, ritualistic purposes sure well and even the rituals are are dying out and it's more often um some sort of like substitute some sort of um Mm. what is the word that i want symbolic cannibalism yeah like communion like communion yes exactly like communion (laughs) so um but even when it occurs as cannibalism in countries that we consider evolved so i'm going to use the u.s because to my knowledge, there is nowhere here where ritualistic cannibalism of any kind is acceptable. Even in those cases, it is hardly ever I kill someone and eat them. Right. It still ends up being I've eaten someone for survival. I have obtained tissue from someone who is either still alive or died in some other fashion who's not going to miss this muscle. I'm going to do it for art. I'm going to do it for science. It's still not okay, but it doesn't involve hurting another human being. Right. In since 1900, so in the last 120 years, do you want to guess how many recorded instances of cannibalism not convictions because some of them were not illegal and some of them are are like definitely recorded we know it's true but they were never convicted or were never caught make a guess in 120 years 10 21 well so not quite as comforting but still not very many but 120 years 21 that's right one every five years right it's not that terrible no so you being killed and eaten by a tiny man because you have pale arms, unlikely to happen. I do have pale arms. <laughs> nope. You are totally safe. kind of want to get some more tattoos now, just in case. <laughs> just in case. No one wants to eat that. <laughs> no, 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 no. Don't mess up the ink. <laughs> right. <laughs> so don't worry about cannibals tonight. You might be a little grossed out, but you don't have to worry about it. Not going to happen. All right. Totally safe. Crossing that off the worry list. There you go. Do you have a story for me? I do. So when we first came up with the idea for Crime Cozy. It there... makes me think of like a drink cozy. <laughs> right. No, we might, need, we, we might need to get some merch. <gasps> yes. <laughs> this is the first story I thought about. Um, because this is the story of every parent's nightmare. Oh, no. And this is a story I grew up with. Oh, no. Um, yeah, I had a real hard time with the story. You're having a real hard time with the story already and you haven't started. I am. <sighs> Jacob Irwin Wetterling was born on February 17th, 1978 in Long Prairie, Minnesota. He was the second of Patty and Jerry Wetterling's four children. His sister, Amy, is about three years older. His brother, Trevor, was a year younger, and his sister, Carmen, was three years younger. That is a lot of kids. That is a lot of kids. (laughs) (laughs) They lived in a quiet cul-de-sac in St. Joseph, Minnesota, which is a small town about 75 miles northwest of Minneapolis, which is primarily known as the home of the College of St. Benedict. Okay. On Sunday, October 22nd, 1989, a little after 9 p.m., Jacob, who was 11 at the time, went to the local Tom Thumb convenience store with his brother Trevor, who was 10, and his best friend Aaron Larson, who was also 11. They went to rent videos and buy some candy and pop, because it's Minnesota and it's pop. (laughs) (laughs) After they selected The Naked Gun, a fine movie choice, (laughs) Jacob and Trevor got on their bikes to ride home, and Aaron hopped on his scooter. About half a mile away from home, a man appeared at the end of a driveway, wearing a mask and holding a gun. Mm -hmm. He instructed the boys to lie down in a ditch and then asked them their ages. After hearing that Trevor was 10, the man told him to run into the woods and not look back or he'd be shot. After Aaron said that he was 11, the man studied his face and told him to run too. Both boys ran as fast as they could and they didn't see what happened to the man or to Jacob. 
The boys ran back to their neighborhood to the teenager that was hanging out with Carmen, who was the youngest sister, because she didn't want to go to the store. Uh, the teenager was Rochelle. She called her dad, and her dad called 911, and the police arrived six minutes later. It's a good response time. It is a small town. Yeah. They went to where the boys had seen the man and found Jacob's footprints on the driveway by where the man had been standing. But then they ended, and there seemed to be some sort of resistance. And then there were the tire tracks. Despite huge search parties, bringing in additional help from the Twin Cities, the Stearns County Sheriff uh, decried the lack of leads. An FBI profiler was brought in, and the Wetterlings decided to seek out as much publicity as they could. Four days later, Jacob's abduction was reported on the news program, A Current Affair. The day after that, Governor Rudy Purpage activated the National Guard, the State Patrol, and the Department of Natural Resources to search a 700-square-mile area for Jacob. Wow. On November 6th, a sketch was released of a man that was seen at the Tom Thumb on the night of Jacob's abduction, saying that they had exhausted other means of finding him. He was described as a middle-aged white man with white hair, about 200 pounds, and he'd been glaring at the other customers. Two more sketches were released six days later on November 12th. By November 20th, the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension and the FBI began removing agents from the case due to lack of leads. And that was it. Over the years, a couple of different people were identified as suspects or persons of interest in Jacob Wetterling's disappearance, but no one was charged and evidence continued to be insufficient. Four months after Jacob's disappearance, his parents started the Jacob Wetterling Foundation, which is an advocacy advocacy group for children's safety. In 1994, this group was instrumental in the passage of the Jacob Wetterling Act, which was the first federal law to institute a state sex offender registry. Uh, the law has been amended several times, most notably by Megan's Law in 1996 and the Adam Walsh Child Protection and Safety Act in 2006. For years, no movement was made in the Jacob Wetterling case. Every year in October, there would be tributes and rehashing of his disappearance, but no new information came to light until 2014. In May of that year, investigators stated that they were taking another look at a series of attempted and actual child molestations that occurred in the Painesville area in the two years preceding Jacob's disappearance. Painesville is close. Close. <laughs> close to St. Joseph. Uh, I'm not real sure how, uh, how close. Um, and they especially looked at the sexual assault of a then 12-year-old boy um, in January of 1989, about 10 months before Jacob went missing. Mm -hmm. Back in 1989, the authorities had believed that the two cases were related, but there just wasn't enough evidence in either of them. Mm -hmm. In 1989, Danny James Heinrich was interviewed multiple times. He provided DNA samples. I'd like to point out this was 1989. Yeah. <laughs> um, Provided DNA samples and agreed to have his residence searched, but there was not enough evidence, nor was forensic science sophisticated enough right. to connect him to either crime. However, later testing matched his DNA with the other assault. And although the statute of limitations had expired for that event, a search warrant was granted. His home was searched and there was so much child pornography that he was arrested. I mean, thank God for that. I... Yeah. Heinrich decided to cooperate with authorities as part of a plea deal. And on September 1st, 2016, he led it investigators to Jacob's body near Painesville, which is about 30 miles away from where Jacob was living and a short distance from where Heinrich was living in 1989. Patty Wetterling, Jacob's mother, confirmed that Jacob had been found uh, in a message to CARE 11, which is our local NBC affiliate. In her words, Jacob has been found and our hearts are broken. Heinrich made a full and graphic confession. He eventually pleaded guilty to one of the 25 child pornography charges. As part of the plea deal, he will be uh, he will not be charged with either the other boy's sexual assault or Jacob's murder. He was sentenced to the maximum sentence of 20 years for that charge and will likely face civil commitment as a sexual predator if he is ever released. 
Although Heinrich could possibly be released in 17 years from the start of his prison sentence, uh, Judge Turnheim, who's the presiding judge, told him that it was unlikely as, quote, this crime is so heinous, so brutal and awful that it is unlikely society will ever let you go free. Um, I was 14 when Jacob Wetterling disappeared. And um, it was such big news, you know, I, I said something to you not too long ago about Jacob's disappearance. And I was so stunned that you didn't know about it because it was such a formative life. And I, um, today yeah. when we were out with our friend, I, I showed him what I that was studying yeah. and he's, he's quite a lot younger than I am. Yeah. And he knew who he was. Right. Um, I still have my Jacob's Hope t-shirt. Uh, the, the year after he disappeared, I turned 15 and I got a job at the Edina Byerly's. And they set up, uh, the Wetterling Foundation set up a table outside of Byerly's and I, I bought a, a t-shirt. And it's one of those t-shirts like the ones from Girl Scout camp and like concerts that yeah. I just can't give to the thrift store. Right. Um, I learned last night when I was researching this that there's another personal connection that I didn't know about. My um, husband's cousin... Emily Brisey is a writer uh, and a teacher, an English teacher, of course. Of course. And she published, um, um, as part of a series of, of novellas, um, a story called This Is My Oldest Story. And it talks about getting on her bike and riding to the site where Jacob disappeared from and how the FBI came to talk to her parents that night and how she was friends with Carmen. And I didn't know any of these things. And she talks about how now that she has children, how she's taught them to lock the door. And how much it's influenced her as a parent. And I thought back to that time in my life, and I remembered that Jeff Jamar, who was the head of the FBI in Minnesota at the time, his son sat next to me in Mr. Kudrowski's math class, and I thought he was hot. <laughs> Deeply fucking damaged, but hot. <laughs> I think you'd have to be. I mean, yeah. And and this was, I mean, that was, well, I guess I would have known him a year or so before Jacob disappeared. Mm. This is a story that I think is in the heart of every parent in Minnesota. Yeah. Um. This man has given interviews. He has given a full confession. He is 100% cooperated with the police. He insists that he has never touched anybody else since Jacob. I don't know if I believe that or not. I'd like to. And I'm not going to rehash what happened, but it's awful. And there are parents out there that now live with that knowledge. Yeah. I always say that the hardest part about parenting is not laughing, but it's not. The hardest part about parenting is the abject terror that you feel every single day. Knowing that any moment your child could get hurt or sick or grow missing or die. And as a parent, I see Jacob's story in a very different light. As a young teenager, when he disappeared, we were warned to stay away from strangers and not to be alone and to have safe words with our families if anybody tried to come pick us up that, that wasn't them. And it all seemed so unlikely and distant and paranoid. Mm -hmm. But as a parent, every single story like this is something that can happen to my child. And not only is it something that can happen to my child, but it probably will if I'm not careful with him. But the good news is it totally won't. According to the Poly Class Foundation, 99.8% of children who go missing come home. That is a wonderful statistic. Oh, my God. It gets better. <laughs> Nearly 90% of missing children uh, simply misunderstood directions or miscommunicated their plans. Yeah. They got lost or they ran away. 9% are kidnapped by family members in custody disputes. 
3% are kidnapped by non-family members, usually during the commission of another crime like a robbery, robbery or a sexual assault, and the kidnapper is somebody the child knows. Only about 100 children per year in the United States, which is less than 100th of 1% of all children that go missing, are kidnapped in the stereotypical stranger scenario, Mm -hmm. and half of those children come home. Wow. In 2017, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children assisted law enforcement and families with more than 27,000 cases of missing children. For comparison, there were an estimated 73.7 million children between the ages of birth and 17 in 2017. That means there is a 0.0366% chance of your child going missing. And if they do, there's a 99.8% chance that they will come home safely. That is a 1 in 1,364,815 chance that your child will go missing and not come home. You are more likely to die by falling out of bed. That is one in 366,804. Which is alarmingly likely. Higher than you think it should be. Right. (laughs) Finding a pearl in an oyster, which is one in 12,000. Being injured by a toilet, one in 10,000. I feel like that's probably higher, actually, and just not reported. I, yes. <laughs> Die in a plane crash. That's one in 205,552. It's a little alarmingly high as well. But again, most of those are like private planes. Not, True. Not commercial. That's not a commercial flight. Okay. That but, makes me feel good because I don't fly that way. Well, and there are many years where there are no commercial plane yeah. fatalities. Yeah. And be attacked by a shark. One in 60,453. Again. Real high. Well, I couldn't find out whether that was per capita, like worldwide or in a certain place, because that seems more, yeah. more likely than I think. Like, well, more likely than I think it should be. I think you probably have to wonder too, like, what counts as a shark attack? Right. And, you know, that's not being eaten by a shark. Right. That uh, could be. Now, it sand is. Sand shark nibbled your toes. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, a couple of things. The Wetterling Foundation does really amazing work. Patty Wetterling is still very involved. She was a state legislator for a while. Um, she's a wonderful woman who's doing a lot of things. Uh, ditto for the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Um, also, I would like to pimp Cousin Emily's story. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, it is heartbreaking. Yeah. Uh, it is called This Is My Oldest Story, and it is available on Amazon. We'll link in the show notes. Awesome. But when I think about the worst thing that I can imagine happening to my child, Mm -hmm. this is it. And the fact of the matter is, statistically speaking, there is almost no chance. (sighs) Okay. That is good to know. Your story is seriously sad and serious. I didn't. You know, Emily's story is called This Is My Oldest Story, and she talks about how it's not her story, but it is Mm -hmm. her story. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, you know, as somebody who was near his age and not too far from his location, Mm -hmm. that that still lives where this happened, and now I'm a parent, Mm -hmm. it's all of our stories. Yeah. You know, having something like that happen in my formative years so close to home, I'm sure affects how I parent. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But I also think about the the one time that I probably was considered to have gone missing. It was miscommunication. Yeah. They thought I was coming home. I had thought I had told them I wasn't. Yeah. Know? Yeah. Um, I do find that comforting. Right. And I find it, especially since... Uh, what happened when I went missing is I stayed after school. I was, on, oh. I was on newspaper and I thought I had told my parents, like, I'm going to stay after school. I'm going to walk home. Cause it wasn't that was like a yeah. mile. It was like a mile. Um, and it, I don't know if they thought I was coming home earlier than I was, or if they didn't, I, we just, we miscommunicated is what yeah. it came down to. And they came looking for me before I showed up at home. And I remember my mom telling me we were looking for your feet under all the bushes. Oh my gosh. 
Now, first of all, it was walking home on main roads in fucking Edina, Minnesota. Like, yeah. nobody is going to, at, you know, four or five in the afternoon. <laughs> like, right, you know, right. Unlikely altogether. Anyway, and if you kill somebody on the side of a, you know, heavily populated road in suburban Minneapolis, you don't leave their feet sticking out. Right, right. <laughs> well, I don't know. My guy left a hand hanging out of a suitcase. Well, so. true, but it was the 70s. It was different. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, also now that I think about it, that was probably the year Jacob went missing. Right. I mean, that was junior high for me. Yeah. That affects every, everything. Yeah. And probably will for a really long time, even after it's solved. Well, it still does. And, you know, we think about um, some of the really interesting thing I read was like myths about child abduction and, and a lot of it came down to it's super unlikely it's probably somebody you know they're going to come home safe Right. like having a story like Jacob's is so so like it's it stands out because it is so unusual right right Um. but a lot of the articles I read which was really interesting talked about how when we were kids we were taught about stranger, stranger danger, danger. Mm-hmm. and how bad that was yes um, super Super damaging because then you don't look at the people who are actually the danger. Well, right. Because the people who are actually the danger are not generally the people that seem like they are actually the danger. Right. And that's something to remember, too, with your children. If your child disappears, they either like their phone is dead and they fucking forgot to tell you where they were going. Right. And that was the other thing they said, too, is there are far fewer missing children because everybody has a phone. Right. Right. Um, but, you know. They've miscommunicated almost always. Right. They've run off. They'll be back. Right. Or if they were abducted, you know who did it. Yeah. And you probably have a real good idea of who did it. Yeah. Look really close first. Right. Or are you divorced? Guess what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Diana, this is a depressing end of an episode. But it's not. No, it's not. It's comforting. It is comforting. And... Uh, I was telling my husband, I was trying to tell him pre-coffee statistics, which basically came out as like, it's never going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> like, the number was super big. <laughs> right. I, it was lots of zeros. There was, I had, to, I had to pull out, I had to pull out Excel for the second time in <laughs> second week in a row to do math for my story. Guys, I think that Diana might secretly enjoy calculating statistics and things for stories maybe a tiny bit but (laughs) but it does make me feel better i mean that is something you know because when i told jeff he's like that doesn't actually make me feel any better like it's still a fear and i'm like it actually makes me feel a lot better yeah well yeah (sighs) no and i think the world is a lot safer than i think it is both safer and more dangerous than we think i think that we aren't afraid of the right things we're afraid of the monsters and the cannibals and the child abductors and the serial killers and you know the person who totally loses it on drugs on a bus and that's not that's not likely and it's not realistic and i think that's sort of the point of this month is right the reason that people listen to true crime stories is because they're sensational they're yeah. crazy, crazy things that people do, but they're crazy, crazy things because they don't happen very often. Well, not only that, but I think that something that I've started to realize as we've done this is I feel a lot better about my normalcy, mm-hmm. if that makes sense, and my issues and... yeah. And my mental health struggles and my, like, ability to function as a human being. Yeah. But also maybe some, like, traumas. Right. Like, things, comparatively, there is a lot worse, and I'm not likely to ever experience it. Right. And that's kind of nice. Right. Does not mean we should not be cautious. You should absolutely be cautious. You should be careful. Like, don't go walking down the street in the middle of the night screaming, I have lots of money on me. Right. Um, but the fact of the matter is, even if you do, there is likely to not be much that happens to you. Right. I'm still feeling a little down. I think we can turn this around. I think we should celebrate some people. Let's do that. Let's do that.
You know what we have? What? We have. Uh huh. Not one. What? Not two. What? But three show sponsors. Woo! So, Crime Crazy is sponsored by M. Gillum. Yay! Elizabeth Wilder. Woohoo! And new this week, Dave Hat. Woo! Otherwise known as former roommate Dave. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Crime Crazy, Dave. Thanks, Dave. I guess you're not as big of an asshole as I always tell people you are. <laughs> <laughs> she does not. It's lies. Shh. <laughs> Show sponsors support Crime Crazy through Patreon at the $10 per month level or above. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A special thank you to our Patreon supporters. We do monthly shout outs for our Patreon supporters, which will happen next week. So you've got time. You got time. You Get it in there. Let's do this thing. <laughs> If you'd like to support Crime Crazy, please check out our Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash crimecrazypod or search for Crime Crazy Podcast. All patrons get a monthly shout out on the show. If you don't want to support us through Patreon or are not able to do that at this time, if you would like to receive a shout out, please rate and review us on iTunes or Podbean or Podwoohoo. <laughs> <laughs> any, any podcast, Google Play or podcast or whatever that app is called yeah they keep changing it uh facebook anywhere anywhere we give shout outs for all reviews but we like the five star ones the best and we have a new review <gasps> we do we do do you know five star you... five stars Woo! thank you savage pixie also known as candace thanks candace love you I, at this point we're pretty much being supported by diana's friends <laughs> no 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 you can follow Crime Crazy on Facebook.com slash Crime Crazy Pod. From there, catch up on the conversation by joining the two Crime Crazy groups. There is the public group, and then there is the private group where you can talk about all manner of fucked up things without all your relatives knowing. It's true. We can talk about cannibals, guys. Do what you want. Neither of us are apparently grossed out terribly. Yeah. We're not going to throw up. That's one of those things where in my head I'm like, am I a sociopath? Should I be messed up right. by this? I, I think that we just compartmentalize I think so. Well, because if I think about it, yeah, no, that's really, really not okay. I could never do it. But super messed up. But if I just think about it as like, how much more shocking could this get? Then yeah, that's okay. No, I you might be a sociopath. It's tough to say. No, <laughs> I am charming, <laughs> right? You pretty much fit into society. I'm not that charming. <laughs> you can follow us on Twitter at Crime Crazy Pod. You can follow us on Instagram at Crime Crazy Pod. You can visit our website at crimecrazypodcast.com or email us at crimecrazypodcast at gmail.com. You can follow us on Twitter. You're at Aaron Pline. I'm at Diana underscore Secon. Follow us on Instagram. You're at E Pline. And I'm at, God damn it, you guys. I tried to change it this week. <laughs> <laughs> she has her new name picked out. Oh, I'm not going to use that. I'm going to oh. go with Diana underscore Secon, but like I tried to start a separate account and then I decided I didn't want to do that and then I deleted it, but apparently it didn't delete all the way, so I can't change the name for this one. It is a mess. I'm working on it. If anybody knows anything, please reach out. <laughs> <laughs> I told you she's never going to change. I knew. I spent significant time the other day trying to figure this shit out. <laughs> On this episode of Diana's Struggles with Instagram. Oh, Lord. <laughs> oh, so, uh, you know, class underscore broad underscore must be. <laughs> <laughs> so I have an update slash shout out. Can I sneak it in right here? Sneak it. Sneak it. All right. So the shout out is to an unnamed individual who knows exactly who she is. And she's fantastic. Is it me? Um, you are also fantastic. <laughs> you are also fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> happy, so, happy crime cozy. Yes. Um, but then I also wanted to uh, pimp something for her. Uh, so last week we talked about Lindsay Bonestall and her murder. Um, and so the update portion of this is, and, and we actually discovered this as we were getting ready to publish the episode and did a little bit more research. We had talked about how her murderer, James Cook, had taken the blue Sharpie and written KKK on the wall to try to make it look like a hate crime. And we 
assumed wrongly that it was because she was black or she was dating someone who was black. And so it would have in some way made sense. Mm -hmm. It is actually just more evidence that he was totally clueless. James Cook was black. Right. Lindsay was not, and she was not dating anyone at the time of her murder. So um, just more weird, random behavior from someone who obviously... Well, it was something that, um, so I think we've made it fairly clear that we don't talk about what we're going to talk about on the show until we're recording. Right. And I don't usually look stuff up until I'm working in the social media for the week. Right. And I had to, you had to send me a link because there are a lot of James Cooks out there. And there I are. Yes. Couldn't yeah. find the right one. Yeah. I had the benefit of having like some more names and ages and right. all of that when I was researching. Right. So I asked you to send that. You sent me the Murderpedia. And the first thing that pops up is his mugshot. And I texted you, like, I didn't know he was black. Yeah, that I didn't either. makes this whole thing more fucked up. Yeah, and now it makes no sense. And the only thing, I've given this so much thought this week. Like, after after you sent me that, right. and I was like, well, shit, I should have looked at this <laughs> picture. <laughs> the only thing I can think is that perhaps that was just the worst thing he could think of. Like, the worst group that would do terrible things. I can see that, but... I mean, I don't know a lot about the KKK. Yeah, no, it doesn't make any sense. Right. It doesn't seem like their MO. No, no. But a lot of things he did did not make any sense. He did not seem to be carefully thinking through <laughs> his, his various crimes. Whether or not he was even capable of doing so. No, <laughs> yeah. So um, so that that is my little bit of update. So now that is all all clear as mud. Um and what I'd like to pimp is, um, although that seems a really crude way to say that yes. we would like to promote, promote, let you yes. know about, uh, there is a foundation in Lindsay Bonestall's, uh, memory. And I believe that it was set up by her parents. Um, but either way it is called peace outside campus mm -hmm. and you can go to peaceoutsidecampus.org to look up and get more information on that um, but it is a really great cause it you know promotes safety and it promotes um, I think that it focuses largely on university students who aren't mm -hmm. living on campus but still need that safety and protection of living in some sort of community that that is going to take care of them because they're still kids yeah um so, great cause. Check that out. Look we'll put it in it. the show notes. We'll put it in social media this week. Definitely. And thank you again, unnamed fan, who is amazing. Thank you. So, Diana, do you have any advice for us this week? I do. If you are in a Parisian park mm. and you see a suitcase, mm. And it has a hand sticking out of it. Mm. Let's remember that not everything needs to be investigated by you. Right. You can leave that for someone else. You call the authorities. Please do. Yeah. Don't open any abandoned containers of any sort ever. Yeah. 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 So if you find a suitcase with a hand on it, call the authorities. Don't touch it because it's probably evidence. Yeah. Yeah. Even though it is the month of Halloween, that does not mean it is an innocent prop. Just better safe than sorry. Right. Yeah. Don't fall into that trap. Yeah. Call your people. Call your people. We almost all have cell phones. And even if you don't, you probably can get your hands on a phone. Call your people. Call your people. And don't end up on next week's episode. Happy Crime Cozy.